and let me welcome our guest today, uh, who is Adrian Gaden. He studied mathematics and computer science in Grenoble and then obtained his PhD from INRIA and Microsoft Research in Paris in 2012. Today, he is the head of machine learning research at the Toyota Research Institute, an institution dedicated to exploring the potentials of artificial intelligence for autonomous driving and robotics. His work revolves around applying machine learning to robot autonomy, which among other things, involves building a robust understanding of the robot's environment. Today, Adrian will talk about exactly that problem, extracting the maximum amount of information from sensor data, and then using these data to understand the world around the robot, which at the end of the day is not that different to what we try to do in science. And with that, Adrian, please, the stage is yours. Awesome. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Peter, for uh, the invitation. Uh, it's my uh, pleasure to be there. Um, I have a soft spot for Oxford because I remember during my PhD, I was invited uh, by Andrew Zissiman to spend a, a couple of weeks there. And it was just an amazing experience. Uh, really uh, helped me a lot uh, during my PhD. So it's a pleasure to uh, give back a little bit and, and, and share uh, the progress uh, we've made at TRI. Um, we do a lot of stuff uh, across the board, as Philip mentioned, on uh, robotics, autonomous driving. Uh, but I thought um, uh, I would talk mostly about the computer vision work uh, we've done. Uh, at the end, if you have questions about, uh, about the rest or about this, uh, just feel free to, to just ask. So the, the main, uh, I would say the main research uh, thrust uh, we have in the team uh, beyond other areas like prediction, planning, et cetera, has been uh, computer vision and in particular self-supervised 3D vision. And so we've done a lot of uh, research covering uh, this big problem uh, that Philip mentioned about uh, understanding the world uh, and making sense of it for a robot. Um, so that covers uh, scene understanding, um, but that covers um, also behavior modeling and prediction, learning for planning and control. And, and one of the key uniqueness of our approach at TRI is uh, we're not going for the um, very cost intensive uh, manual supervision uh, because we don't think that's just gonna work at Toyota scale. Uh, we're looking at self-supervised learning and other ways to scalably supervise uh, robots and self-driving cars, including simulation and auto-labeling. And we've been quite uh, productive at this uh, with a lot of papers um, in recent years. And actually some of this technology that you're seeing today uh, used in, in production. So one provocative way uh, of thinking about our research agenda is, um, uh, and in the trend of machine learning papers that end with is all you need, is uh, one eye is all you need. Um, of course, uh, that's not true. Uh, you need more. Uh, but it's an interesting scientific question. Uh, can we learn robot perception from raw videos only? Can we get robust 3D depth estimation from a single monocular camera in particular is something that has been um, exciting us scientifically and has had some positive impact uh, in applications down the line. So just as a, as a reminder, um, uh, you've, hear, you've maybe heard sometimes the term pseudo LIDAR. Um, uh, it's the same thing as monocular depth estimation which is about taking a single RGB image and outputting a depth map uh, per pixel uh, range estimates. How far is the object uh, that was captured uh, in, that, in that pixel? So again, naturally the question in the age of uh, rich sensor suites, stereo, LIDAR, uh, you name it, uh, why monocular depth? Um, and in particular from the angle of driving and robotics. So first and foremost, there's, a, there's something obvious, which is the camera is uh, the uh, lingua franca, uh, if you pardon my French. It's, it's, the, it's the universal sensor. It's everywhere. Uh, it's the cheapest sensor you can buy. Uh, it's common in robots and cars, but also in your mobile phones. Um, the second uh, is that uh, in complex sensor suites, like the ones uh, you'll see today uh, that is common in self-driving cars, for instance, uh, you often have, like for uh, cost minimization reasons, you have often a wide baseline. We don't litter uh, the car with a bazillion number of cameras. Um, we try to minimize and optimize the sensor placement. Uh, and again, in the order of reducing costs so that you can commercialize products uh, at, a, at a very large scale. Um, as a reminder, Toyota sells 10 million cars every year. So at this scale, you're thinking about cost. Um, so the other uh, uh, important thing in robotics is redundancy, obviously. And so uh, no sensor is perfect, uh, uh, even cameras, even LiDAR. Uh, 
Um, and so having multiple different sensors uh, that are capable of uh, the same features, uh, the same functionalities uh, enables you to get uh, robustness from redundancy. And that's related to the Byzantine generals problem and et cetera. And uh, now monocular, why depth in particular? Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a legitimate question because we care about 3D objects, right? Uh, like we're detecting where the objects are. So do we care about every pixel, uh, uh, every, every range, the range of underlying every pixel? Uh, and the answer is yes, because um, interestingly, uh, if you want, even if you just want to detect objects in 3D uh, from vision, the main bottleneck today is monocular depth. If we had good depth estimates, uh, we would have much, much better uh, 3D detection. So it's the scientific bottleneck right now. And so the overarching question in our research is, uh, is robust 3D vision um, uh, possible thanks to large scale cell supervision? Now that's a specific scientific question that uh, me and my team, a part, a part of my team have been studying uh, extensively in this past few years. So um, as just a, a quick refresher, um, so Supervised learning, you get raw data, which is easy to acquire, right? Just record uh, uh, the sensor stream. You feed it into a model, and out of it, you get predictions. And you pay a loss um, to basically uh, train your model, right, by gradient descent and backpropagation in the usual way. Um, and that loss is computed by uh, computing an error with respect to ground truth, right? Uh, target value, uh, uh, target values, right, or, or labels. And that is uh, the uh, little dirty secret that everybody in machine learning knows. Um, uh, which is that is uh, what drives performance is how much label data you can get and the quality of that label data. So in self-supervised learning, um, it's different. You go from raw data to model to prediction, same, uh, but the loss is not paid uh, by comparing to the ground truth. Uh, it's paid by comparing to the raw data itself. And, uh, and so how do you do that? Well, obviously, uh, you, you can't just have a reconstruction objective. You need to inject more inductive priors, so help learning the right things. And that's where prior knowledge really comes into play. Uh, the reason we're, we're doing this is because um, we have large volumes of unlabeled but structured data. So we can make some assumptions about uh, you know, the road, other objects, or about geometry. And uh, there's also multiple sensors, so you can make assumptions about uh, the relative calibration of the different sensors and things like that. Um, one thing to, um, that is different in our research when we talk about self-supervised learning is that it's different than image classification uh, self-supervised learning that you might be uh, familiar with. Uh, because here, we're not talking just about the pre-training task. We're not just trying to learn a good representation and then use that representation uh, in a fine-tuning way and a transfer learning way for a downstream task for which we have labels. Here, the task itself, which is predicting that, is self-supervised. So after the self-supervised learning, the model is ready to be used. So uh, with this brief intro, I'll, I'll, I'll basically dive in, right in into uh, the three big topics that I wanted to cover and the research uh, um, uh, that we've done in the team around 3D self-supervision, how to go beyond self-supervision because that's uh, not a panacea either. Um, and, and more importantly, how do we use monocular depth? So it all started um, uh, actually with uh, a really uh, famous paper uh, from Clément Godard et al. Um, uh, about uh, self-supervised stereo training, where uh, they sh they've shown that basically you can use some simple geometric constraints when you have a stereo pair, so two time synchronized frontal parallel cameras, where you can feed in the left image from your stereo pair into a monodepth network, get a depth uh, prediction or a disparity prediction. Um, and then you can use uh, the equations of projective geometry to warp the pixels from the left image onto the right image because you know the baseline. And, and that can enable you to reconstruct the right image from the left image. And then you can compare the pixels, which is called uh, the photometric loss. And if your pixels are not aligned uh, in color space, then it means uh, not geometry is wrong, obviously, but it means that your depth network is wrong. And that gives you a useful signal to back propagate and then learn this network. Um, and so that's why you see that uh, in the learning objective uh, for self-supervised learning, uh, you're lear trying to learn this uh, theta hat uh, parameters and you're minimizing uh, a, a, an empirical risk, which is a sum over losses over the different image pairs. Um, and it has multiple different terms the photometric loss, which is the loss that you obtain, you have used synthesis by comparing pixels, as I just explained. 
plus a sum of other losses to try to um, add a bit more uh, structure uh, to your depth maps, for instance, by regularizing using edge-aware uh, depth smoothing or by also regularizing for occlusions. And so that work um, uh, really inspired us. And uh, we uh, made um, a paper called Super Depth, where one of the things we noticed is that um, obviously the more pixels you have or the more, the higher the, your resolution, the easier the problem is. And that's because most of papers and research deal with limited resolution. So they haven't really necessarily seen that fact before. But as soon as we started to use our data and trying to use it in the cars, we realized that if you want to improve your performance, uh, just increase your resolution uh, mechanically. Um, for self-driving, it's very important because you want to know how far things are uh, for far away things so that you have the time to react to them. So you need a high resolution. And if you train these networks at high resolution, which is not trivial either because it requires a lot of memory, uh, it requires uh, maybe some different optimization techniques. But if you are able to do that, that improves performance. And so one natural uh, uh, extension uh, of that thought process was to say, well, in a typical depth network, you do an encoder decoder where you're compressing spatially the information into the encoder. And then you're trying to reinterpolate missed details, basically, uh, by decoding uh, at progressively high resolution back towards the input resolution. And again, this is typically done for like memory uh, constraints, uh, also uh, to some extent to prevent overfitting and things like that. But uh, here we basically in the super depth network uh, just uh, looked at the uh, neighboring field of super resolution and uh, looked at how to recover lost details uh, from images or in this case feature maps. And uh, there's uh, a set of new interesting operators that had come out at the time called uh, subpixel convolutions, which we've used and extended basically this encoder decoder architecture to try to learn to recover lost details uh, by uh, using these super resolution techniques uh, for the intermediate disparity maps. Um, that turned out to work really well. So working at a high resolution and using subpixel convolutions to super resolve intermediate disparity maps. And as you can see at the top, depth maps. Uh, one of the benefits is also because it's a stereo pair for which you know the baseline in, in meters. Uh, you can actually also reconstruct point clouds metrically scaled point clouds uh, with the camera uh, calibration information, the stereo rigging calibration information. This is what you see at the bottom. That's great, uh, but stereo is not really ubiquitous. Uh, also has some challenges with respect to uh, calibration and maintaining that calibration over time if you're in a pothole uh, or something like that. Um, and so one of the, the, the major source of information for us is actually monocular videos. And so, uh, the question then naturally uh, came for, uh, can we do the same thing uh, with a generalized type of stereo setup where instead of having two time synchronized front of parallel cameras, we have one single camera, but we're using the frame T minus one and frame T. And uh, the answer is yes, uh, you can use a similar idea, um, but there's uh, uh, some uh, differences. Uh, namely the fact that now you also need to predict uh, how the camera has moved from frame T minus one to frame T. And you can use very expensive and precise sensors to do that as in self-driving cars, but turns out you really don't need to, uh, to do that. Uh, you can actually just feed camera pairs, frame T minus one and frame T into a convolutional network that tries to regress the rotation and translation uh, of the camera, which is also called the ego motion and, uh, and use that for view synthesis. And uh, the equation then uh, is this one, where you're trying to basically synthesize a target frame, let's say frame uh, T, uh, from a context frame or a set of context frames. And, um, and the way you do that is you, again, predict the depth uh, from uh, the image, predict the pose from the two pairs of images, and then projective geometry tells you if you have the camera calibration, the intrinsic K, and the ego motion uh, T hat, and the depth D hat, you can basically exactly reconstruct uh, the uh, uh, frame T from frame T minus one using this, uh, this equation. Um, that is a reprojection equation of the pixels using the pinhole camera model. And so we've proposed basically this network called PACnet uh, in, the, in our CPR uh, paper uh, from 2020 called 3D Packing for Self-Supervised Monocular Depth Estimation. And this network basically built upon the insight of super depth, uh, which is uh, same thing, resolution matters. And um, 
And to quote uh, a very famous paper uh, from uh, Andrew Zissman, uh, the devil is in the details. Um, and especially for the photometric loss, where if you remember, we're warping the pixels from frame T to frame T minus one and comparing the pixels in this photometric loss. So the higher your resolution, the more detail you capture and the more, the less ambiguous your photometric loss is going to be. For instance, two pixels on my vest right now would look black. So if you, if you, if you are at a low resolution, you, they will all look black the same. But if you are at high resolution, you might see some different shadows and maybe some wrinkles or some little um, visual cues that enable you to differentiate pixels and then tell you whether you predicted the right depth and the right ego motion. And so here, uh, as I mentioned, we took this idea of like going further into uh, the details. And uh, instead of doing the traditional encoder decoder where you do uh, pooling operations in the encoder, so max pooling, which is destructive, you lose information, right? Uh, we, we looked at learning this compression. Uh, so we are learning to compress spatial details and then later learning to decompress them. So it's a lossy compression decompression of intermediate features that is done through these packing and unpacking operations that replace max pooling and interpolation that you find in traditional deep networks. Now, how do these packing and unpacking layers look like? Um, it's um, a bit maybe too technical for this talk, but at a, at a high level, you're basically taking your 2D tensor, H by W, and you're shuffling the pixels to pack it along the channel dimension so that you're turning it into, uh, you see here, instead of a CHW tensor, you get a 4C times H by 2, W by 2 tensor. So you're packing along the channel dimension or along the depth, right? This is what's called a space to depth operation. And then what you have is you, you, you basically have a weird kind of tensor uh, because it has like, like pixels and colors along the channel axis. And so uh, one way we found to actually make sense of that feature space of that tensor shape is to use 3D convolutions. Um, to basically learn to pack this into compact uh, 2D tensor uh, uh, rep representation uh, of features. Uh, the, the resolution is still divided by two, but these features uh, are basically learned with some uh, spatial details um, that are preserved. And then unpacking is basically the reverse operation. Uh, one of the um, just proof of uh, like toy examples that you can see whether it makes sense is if you take an input image and you do a kind of two layer like encoder decoder uh, where you use the traditional operation of max pooling and bilinear upsampling and you're trying to learn to reconstruct the details. As max pooling is destructive um, and bilinear upsampling is just simple interpolation, you see that the reconstructed image is very blurry. Um, it's like a very poor encoding. Lossy, lossy, lossy encoding. But if you use a single packing and unpacking operation, you can get almost lossless uh, reconstruction. Um, I won't go into the details of uh, this monster uh, table, uh, but this is a very active field of research with a lot of people uh, working on this very interesting challenge. Uh, one of the interesting things is not just that PacNet actually was the first, uh, it was state of the art uh, method, uh, but also it was the first method where self supervised network. Uh, outperform the supervised state of the art, meaning methods that take an image as input and trying to regress depth from ground truth depth measurements from LIDAR. Um, and in particular, uh, other, other strengths of PACnet was the fact that um, it scaled much better, which is again for us uh, at Toyota something very important. Uh, we're very much thinking at very large scale applications. And so um, we found that it scaled in two ways. One is it scaled better. Uh, if you look at, so the x-axis is, the y-axis is uh, absolute relative error. So lower is better. Uh, on the y-axis, it's number of parameters. And so what we found is that uh, the ResNet uh, type of architectures, uh, they scale better with parameters, but they kind of like taper off, like plateau. Whereas our models, they really scale very well with number of parameters. So depending on your computational budget, um, and uh, the other thing is that with resolution, the higher your resolution, uh, the better your performance, as I mentioned. ResNet is improved a little bit from the orange curve to the yellow curve, but PacNet is improved a lot from the blue curve to the green curve, because that's what it was made to do, to learn to preserve these details. Um, so, and, and again, the reason it doesn't overfit there in spite of the number of parameters is because of the strong inductive biases in, in, in addition, um, especially in the 3D convolutions. By the way, if you are scared about like this size of 
parameter spaces in the hundreds of millions. Uh, that's normal. But one of the cool things is that uh, this can run in real time uh, uh, on GPUs, and this actually runs in the car. Um, we did um, a lot of different ablations. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll skip over that. Um, and one interesting thing also is I mentioned like overfitting risks and, and with big networks like this, but it turns out that, uh, and as often the case in deep learning, over-parameterization over is a good thing. And we found out that our network also generalizes much better uh, to other domains. So for instance, train on KT evaluated on nuisance. Uh, okay, enough of the, of the blah, blah, uh, now some results. Um, so here, what you see is upper left image inputs, lower left, depth map prediction color coded uh, and on the right what you see is a point cloud that we reconstruct from that because again we have the intrinsic uh, intrinsic parameters so we can uh, basically reconstruct uh, a point cloud and so you see this is data from our fleet in Japan uh, in an area of Tokyo uh, close to Tokyo called Odaiba here you see it works on the pedestrians on the cones on the cars on the buses on the road uh, quite far away too uh, previous, you see it works really well on wet surfaces uh, where LIDAR struggles quite a bit, um, including very wet surfaces uh, such as this one. So um, uh, there's uh, here some just more qualitative results to show that um, uh, it captures a lot of details. Um, and in particular, if you see this one on the lower left, uh, you can see through the fence, uh, which I find uh, very, uh, very cool to, to be able to be that precise. Um, all the code for uh, that model that I talked about, uh, PacNet SFM, is available uh, on our GitHub. Uh, the data set that I also talked about, which is called DDAD for Dense Depth for uh, Autonomous Driving, is also available publicly. And we're actually organizing a competition at uh, a workshop that we're organizing at CVPR which is called Frontiers of Monocular 3D Perception. Um, that competition is uh, ongoing. Um, and uh, we encourage you to participate. Uh, still having to have one month uh, to participate. So if you want to start from our code and try to use your own ideas, build upon that, or if you have your own uh, models that you want to try, uh, feel free to give it a go. Uh, cool. Uh, one thing you might have noticed is that uh, it's only front camera. Um, and uh, obviously, in driving, uh, we need 360 3D perception, um, also for certain robotics applications. And so um, to minimize the costs, as I mentioned, you typically don't have like 50 <laughs> cameras uh, all around uh, uh, the car. Um, so instead, you have like a minimal sensor suite, like in, in that case, for instance, six cameras um, uh, with minimal overlap. Uh, so how do you reconstruct a full 360 point cloud from these six cameras? Uh, that's a problem that we called uh, full surround monodepth. And we've just recently uh, put a paper on archive called full surround monodepth for multiple cameras. So FSM is a play on word on structure for motion, SFM. Um, and uh, so the problem and the result looks like something like that. Uh, so this is actually from the new scenes data set where you see that for new scenes, it's, it's even worse than for DDAD in terms of the overlap is extremely small. You see these blue points here which represents uh, the field of view overlap between cameras. So most of the visual field is actually single camera. So another reason to work on monocular depth. And this is on the right, you see, this is what we are able to obtain in terms of a 3D uh, point cloud reconstruction from a single model. And the way we do this is by leveraging again, like a geometry and prior knowledge. But in this, in this case, we have even more that we can leverage, which is this relationship across cameras in space but also in time. And so that's really the key to make the system work is to leverage uh, spatial temporal transformation matrices between cameras. So we don't just leverage the relationship between cameras at the same time, but also across time. And these constraints, and obviously, even if you don't overlap, two cameras don't overlap a lot in their field of view at a given time, because the platform moves, the overlap is increased, right? Different cameras can see the same thing over different uh, time steps. And if you leverage uh, those constraints together with a couple of other important uh, design factors like masking, pho like photometric loss masking and things like that, uh, we managed to get a really good um, reconstruction, a 3D point cloud. Um, and in particular, we're much stronger than uh, like uh, approaches uh, that are trying to reason explicitly uh, in terms of matching, um, like things like cold map, for instance. Uh, so how does it look like uh, in practice? So here you see uh, the six images on the left, uh, the six depth maps, 
the color code of the uh, border of the images correspond to the color code of the cameras that you see on the right. And then you see the point cloud. So uh, obviously, uh, it's not perfect. I wouldn't drive off of this. Uh, but um, it's actually fairly decent uh, and a close range. Um, what you see is uh, some bleeding artifacts around the, the boundaries uh, of objects. Um, that means we should be going even higher resolution and try to be even more precise. Um, but we get one scale, scale consistent point cloud uh, from all these cameras um, with a single model. And that's, uh, again, fully only self-supervised. That's great. Uh, if you remember uh, one important little thing that I mentioned earlier, which is this projection equation, uh, which is assuming a pinhole camera model. Uh, now, um, in the standard pinhole camera model, and projection is a simple matrix vector product, right, as you see here. Um, but it's just an approximation when you have distortion, uh, such as these examples uh, here, like concussion or barrel distortion. And, and it's uh, not a very good model at all when you have uh, wide angle uh, cameras like fisheye cameras or captive object cameras, when you have like uh, panoramas, when you have like a dash cam behind a windshield because the windshield uh, creates some distortions, uh, even worse if you have rain. And uh, also even crazier application would be when you have a camera underwater because the water acts like as a very complicated type of lens. So we can't use geometry, the projected geometry in the pinhole camera model in those instances. And if we, I mean, we can, but the results are gonna be really bad. And then remember when I said self-supervised learning is you compare the pixels after reprojection. And if the reprojection is wrong, it's not because geometry is wrong, it's because the depth is wrong. Well, in this case, it might be geometry that is wrong or your assumption about geometry. So to go beyond pinhole, pinhole cameras, um, we proposed uh, uh, something called neural ray surfaces. So we are leveraging uh, uh, a generalized camera model, uh, which is inspired by Grossberg and Nayar, uh, which is just saying that instead of having a global uh, linear projection operator, uh, we're just going to assume per pixel viewing rays. And uh, so this neural ray surface um, is something we're trying to predict from a single image uh, where we use a deep network to predict uh, these per pixel rays. Um, and that's uh, what we did in our paper uh, uh, mentioned here. So here you see pinhole model, right? Uh, that's a classical uh, a picture of the pinhole camera model uh, where you, again, your equation, simple linear equation. But in the case of this generic camera model where you have neural ray surfaces, uh, you have a much more complicated uh, um, uh, uh, model. Um, so the, for the proposed race, like each 3D point PJ, basically we must find the corresponding pixel PI um, uh, that belongs to uh, IC, uh, the image, um, uh, with ray surface vector QI. So Q are, the, these Q are the ray surfaces, right? And the set of Qs is this neural ray surface. Um, and we have to find for each pixel uh, and each 3D point. Uh, um, so for each 3D point, the pixel whose ray surface is the closest to the direction between uh, PJ, that 3D point, and the camera center SC, right? So here you have, for instance, like three, uh, four Qs and, uh, or three Qs, Q1, Q2, QI, and you're trying to find the Q that's closest, in this case would be Q1. Um, so the problem is that here, you see you're trying to find the best ray surface, the closest ray surface, and you have an argmax over there. And so we, we want to basically find a neural network um, um, that can predict those Qs um, and, uh, and optimize that your back propagation, so your gradient-based optimization. So we approximate this non-differentiable argmax uh, with a softmax over patch-based residual surface um, to have some also regularization, local regularization. And that enables us to get a really fast end-to-end -end differentiable model. So the picture overall looks uh, almost the same as before. Uh, you have an encoder, uh, an image encoder predicts depth via yeah, depth decoder. Uh, you have also smoothness loss and other losses, regularizers. You take two frames, you feed into the pose network, you get the ego motion estimation, again, a rotation translation that doesn't change. But what changes is you have this ray surface decoder that is trying to predict this per pixel ray, um, which you see here color coded uh, arrows. Um, and then you use these equations of the general camera model to do view synthesis, to warp the pixels from one frame to the previous frame and then pay the photometric loss.
So does it work? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, and actually, surprisingly, the same model, the same approach works really well for crazy different configurations. Like here, you see a catadoptic camera from the Omnicam data set. We are able to get a really good depth map and a good accurate uh, point cloud um, over short range, because uh, like Omnicam is basically um, like the catadoptic cameras don't have high resolution for far away objects. Um, this is for uh, fisheye. Uh, same thing, we get uh, like very heavy uh, distortion uh, and we're able to predict the depth really well on the poles, on everything and uh, reconstruct really good uh, point clouds. And this also worked in practice uh, for the dash cam uh, setup uh, that I mentioned before. Uh, same thing, uh, code is available online if you want to try it out. Um, and yeah, of course, it also works in, in, in um, pinhole setups if it can approximate the pinhole camera really well too. Uh, last uh, but not least, uh, I really mentioned, like, uh, briefly mentioned ego motion estimation and the PoseNet part of the architecture. We've also done uh, quite a bit of work on that, uh, whether end to end with deep networks, but also more structured approaches, for instance, using 3D key points and a bit more geometric approach uh, uh, than just predicting rotation translation from pairs of images. Uh, and again, this, this is available online, uh, including the code. All right, so I hope I convinced you that there's significant progress being made in depth estimation, um, uh, but uh, there are still some challenges. Um, and uh, in particular, uh, uh, you, have, but you have some issues with self-supervised learning, uh, but hopefully uh, in practice, you very often have some supervision. And this is where, uh, you know, we're a research institute at a company, so Practicality beats purity, if uh, some of you know the Python Zen. Um, uh, so we're trying to leverage whatever supervision we have, uh, which is common in practice, which would be some supervision from cheap range sensors. So for instance, more and more cars are getting LIDARs, but not the LIDARs that you're thinking about for self-driving cars, just more like low number of beams, like very sparse, cheap range sensors, like with four beams that are there just mainly for colli frontal collision avoidance for safety applications. Uh, but they still return you some 3D points, maybe noisy. Uh, so we could use that. Um, also, very often, as I mentioned, you don't just care about predicting depth. You want to know what are the objects, where they are, et cetera. So you often have semantic labels uh, and you do other tasks like semantic segmentation. And uh, also another big uh, source of information and supervision is uh, synthetic data from simulation. Um, so what we found in all these cases is that we should leverage supervision as much as possible. But what also remotivated us really to work on self-supervised learning is that we found that even when you have this little bit of supervision, uh, what is key to unlock its use is self-supervised learning. Because when you have insufficient supervision, you need to compensate with uh, this prior knowledge, this inductive priors that are uh, encoded in the self-supervised learning approaches. Uh, I won't go into uh, too much details about the semi-supervised learning because it's exactly what you think it is. Uh, in addition to your self-supervised loss, if you know some ground truth 3D points in the world, you can reproject them onto the camera plane and pay an additional loss uh, for those pixels uh, in terms of uh, a supervised loss, uh, just a pure regression loss, depth regression loss. Um, we made a paper on that because what we found is that that loss is very different. Uh, the photometric loss is loss between colors in RGB in the 2D plane. And the 3D loss is typically loss in meters uh, this, uh, in 3D. And so you're comparing basically pixels to 3D points and mixing them into the same loss, uh, which is not works, does not work really well. So for optimization purposes, um, you actually need to reproject the 3D loss into a 2D plane um, using, again, some basic geometry um, 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 that actually turns out to be not done in practice by most people, uh, but actually turned out to be really important. Um, and so that improves performance a lot. And in particular, that can improve performance even when you have very few points, like 100 points uh, per scene. Um, and that's interesting. And because you can assume you have a few points that are available to you during training time. Um, but what about inference time? And actually, if you're assuming that uh, the cars, some cars have some four beam uh, LIDARs, for instance, uh, well, you should be able to use them not just for training, but you should be able to use them for inference. And uh, this is exactly what we've done in our uh, most recent uh, CVPR paper uh, called Sparse Auxiliary Networks for Unified Molecular Depth uh, Prediction and Completion. And the idea is the following, is uh, 
you at the bottom what you see is uh, so at the top sorry what you see is the typical setup of depth prediction where you have an image feed it to a network like PacNet and you get a predicted depth. Uh, but below what you see is you see that if you have a very, very few points in the environment, like not enough to really drive, um, but you want to still leverage them to improve your depth estimates, well, that problem is called depth completion, going from a few points to the completed uh, depth map. Um, and so here, what we do is we use the same network, the depth prediction network, but we are basically imbuing the decoder features with some information about the depth, which we about the sparse depth, which we encode via this sparse auxiliary uh, networks. Now, these sparse auxiliary networks, uh, they're basically sparse convolution with a bunch of convolutional layers that then get uh, transformed and mixed with the decoder features of the depth uh, decoder. And uh, the beauty with that uh, type of approach uh, is that when you have some points, you can just dump them in your decoder uh, via this way. Uh, but when you don't have these points, you can just still use straight up the encoder decoder and predict the depth map. So this doesn't just provide you with the flexibility to use different networks for different cars or different robots that might or might not have this sparse uh, range uh, sensor. Um, but it also works at runtime, where if for some reason uh, drop packets or uh, sensor failure, um, you don't get uh, the depth uh, readings at any given point in time. You can still predict uh, a depth map. Um, and this provides you with uh, this redundancy um, uh, and robustness uh, that, that we need. Uh, I won't go into the details of the sparse res residual block, which are these blocks over there, uh, but essentially relies on sparse, uh, three, uh, sparse convolutions, uh, which are really important for efficiency. Um, how does it? Uh, look, uh, so uh, again, here, no, we can, with the same network, we can basically compare the output of uh, prediction, meaning no sparse input points, or in completion. And what you see is that obviously, when the results are pretty good with prediction, just like before, but for completion, we get a lot more details, like for instance, uh, the bars uh, on this truck. Uh, this also works, so as I mentioned, talk a lot about driving because that's uh, one of the major applications we're thinking about at Toyota, but robotics is also a very big uh, application for us. And so we've also validated that this approach works in uh, home indoor uh, scenarios, which typically are a bit easier because uh, it's a bit cluttered, more cluttered, less structured, but um, uh, has less range. Uh, so uh, it works also pretty well there. Uh, we have much more results in the paper where we show that uh, we can improve the state of the art on depth prediction and get quite competitive with specialized completion approaches. And we also showed that uh, you can use this depth for 3D detection um, and it works quite well, uh, actually better than the traditional supervised depth. Um, and I'll talk a bit about, more about this later. So how does it look? Uh, same thing, bottom left Im input image, bottom right depth map, upper uh, section, it's the uh, predicted uh, depth. And when you see some color points that are flashing in and out, that's when we're switching on and off the sparse uh, input depth. So this is basically, now we're doing completion. Now we're turning off completion. We're, we're, we're resorting. Uh, we're falling back to just prediction. And so uh, that enables you to be very robust to these kind of like maybe sensor failures. So I mentioned like to go beyond self-supervised learning, you can use some supervision, right? Like semi-supervised learning or even like completion, uh, dial what we call dialable perception. You can dial between, you know, the image input or uh, the image plus depth input. Uh, semantics is a big one. Um, and uh, if you if you remember uh, your uh, your basics of uh, computer vision or even human vision, uh, it should be that in theory, geometrically, it's impossible to invert uh, the image, the depth. Right? You get the three D world projected into the two D plane, and there's actually many unprojections that are valid. Uh, uh, for instance, up to a scale parameter. Um, and so it's an ill posed what we call an ill posed inverse problem uh, to do depth prediction from a single image. So why does it even work? Why is it even possible for us to do it? And that's simply because, and why, why can you do it when you look at a, a photograph or when you look uh, with just one eye? And it's because there's obviously patterns that relate appearance uh, to category level geometry. Uh, we all have faces that are different, but are roughly the same dimensions. And so they reproject into the 2D plane 
in uh, a way that is equivalent with how far we are from uh, the camera. Uh, and so obviously, because it works based on uh, appearance and relating appearance to geometry, uh, one natural question is to wonder whether uh, monodef uh, can benefit from uh, pre-trained semantic features. And the answer is yes. Uh, and we uh, showed that in a paper called Semantically Guided Representation Learning for Self-Supervised Monocular Depth. Uh, I won't go into the details, but uh, same idea. Uh, you have a pre-trained semantic network. Uh, you have a depth network. And same idea as, as a PACnet Sun. Uh, you can actually guide the representation learning of the decoder to be more semantic aware. Uh, in this case, we use pixel adaptive convolutions. And so uh, the results are, um, uh, it are um, actually nicer and uh, we improved upon the state of the art again. Uh, what you can see here in particular is that there are certain structures that are really hard, like this pole here is really dark and it's hard to tell uh, whether, uh, you know, what depth and whether it's a pole or not. But but because we're, we're, uh, we're having some more semantic aware features, we can actually recover the depth much better. Uh, same for other type of fin structures uh, that have a weird geometric structure, but that is very consistent across categories like signs, people, trucks, um, things like that. Um, and I mentioned we get a pre-trained semantic network uh, to help us uh, guide the learning of a depth representation. Uh, but where do we where do we get this pre-trained network? And you typically get it from manual labels, but that's very expensive. So one question uh, that we've been exploring is, can we use simulation as a source of supervision? And um, and so the answer again is is yes to those questions. Uh, can we get synthetic data uh, that is useful? Uh, can synthetic semantic segmentation benefit depth? And can depth help uh, seem to reel off some seg? Uh, so it's the other way. It's the two ways, right? It's like, can semantic help depth and can depth help semantic? And they work together in a multitask framework. And the answer is yes. Um, in uh, this very recent paper we put on archive called Gouda, which is about geometric unsupervised domain adaptation for semantic segmentation. Um, and uh, we've, uh, we've shown uh, across multiple data sets uh, how this can work. In a nutshell, uh, you have real data, which is just a video as usual. And same thing as before, it goes to a pose encoder to get the ego motion, goes to an image encoder and a depth decoder to get a depth map. Now this time in addition, goes to a semantic decoder to predict uh, the uh, semantic segmentation information. And, that, uh, and on the semantic, uh, seg uh, on the, sorry, on the simulation side, you have the video, but you also have ground truth, uh, semantic segmentation that comes for free because it's in simulation. You know everything that's happening in the world because you created it depth ground truth and ego motion ground truth. And then what you can do is you can basically feed that through the same uh, uh, network architecture and, uh, and pay uh, the supervised losses in addition to the self-supervised losses. Whereas in the real world, you only pay the self-supervised uh, losses, which is the view synthesis loss. And uh, in addition, there is a couple of different uh, regularizers, uh, regularization terms that you can compute in simulation and that helps stabilize uh, the training. Uh, again, it works really well. So what you're seeing here uh, are examples of predictions of our network. Again, that predicts independently uh, semantic segmentation and, uh, I mean, sorry, jointly semantic segmentation and depth. Um, and we're just superimposing uh, the semantic labels onto the depth uh, uh, point cloud that we're getting. Uh, and all of these predictions are obtained without ever having seen any real world semantic label. Um, so it transfers really well in this problem called seem to real transfer without any uh, supervision in the real world. Uh, I'll skip over this. We have plenty of results in the, in the paper. Uh, interesting stuff we're showing is also that how does it scale? Uh, if you feed more stimulated data, if you feed higher quality simulation, does it get better and better? Um, and the answer is again, yes. Uh, lots of results in the paper. Uh, that's on my archive. I encourage you to check it out. Uh, because I'm running a bit out of time, uh, I'll, I'll go quickly over this. Um, uh, but same thing, uh, there's all these all these uh, works are available online, and feel free to just ping me if you have any questions. So, um, as I mentioned before, we can predict depth, we can predict better depth uh, thanks to uh, like going a bit beyond self-supervised learning. Uh, one natural question is to say, what is it good for? I briefly mentioned three D detection. Uh, so here. It's another example of work uh, where we've done um, 
uh, 3D detection, uh, monocular 3D detection, uh, this paper called Roy 10D, um, and where really you get as input an RGB image, you predict the depth, and then from the depth plus the image features, you can get 3D bounding boxes. Um, and this is actually like an old paper, like old in deep learning uh, days, uh, CPR 2019. Uh, since then, results have improved quite a lot, but actually the approach remains very similar. You predict depth uh, as an intermediate step. Um, so one of the cool things about that work is that we didn't just predict 3D boxes, we also reconstructed uh, 3D shapes. And, uh, and the way uh, we, we did that is by learning some priors over CAD models of the 3D shapes. And then we just regress, in addition to the 3D bounding box, we regress the latent uh, shape encoding uh, uh, to get uh, shape uh, reconstructions, as you see here on the bottom right. And one of the cool things you can do then is you can start to do data augmentation, where you do augmented reality style, where you're adding, you're pasting into the scene uh, fake instances of cars that you reconstructed from other sequences and enables you to like improve your training data uh, with some uh, 3D uh, data augmentation uh, techniques. And we took that actually um, uh, further um, and uh, we looked at a fully auto-labeling scene. So because the previous approach still needs 3D bounding box labels, uh, the ground truth, it's supervised. Um, so we looked at auto-labeling uh, via differentiable rendering. So the same idea as, 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 as before, which would be you are trying to uh, predict parts of the scene, but instead of comparing like parts of the scene, like object shapes, et cetera, to a ground truth, you're instead using a self-supervised approach based on differentiable rendering, where your image, if you see, look at the bottom, uh, the image is fed through a neural network that predicts intermediate scene parameters, objects, their shapes, et cetera. And then you are re-rendering the scene by saying, okay, if I'm right, I'm able to regenerate the pixel values of my input image, right? Because I can re-render the objects in the way that I think they're placed. Um, and then if I'm right, my pixels of my re-rendered image should be close to uh, my input image. And so this is very similar to the idea of view synthesis before. Instead of copying pixels from one image to the other, we're actively deconstructing the image in this inverse rendering process and reconstructing it with the rendering process. Now, this de-rendering process, because it goes through a neural network, it's obviously differentiable. So the hard part is the renderer that needs to be uh, differentiable itself. So you can back propagate through, uh, again, this photometric loss. Uh, and luckily, there's a lot of research in differentiable rendering. Um, and so uh, we've been able to leverage uh, recent differentiable renderers and actually came up with our own 3D differentiable renderer. And this is what you're seeing here in this little animation, which is the whole inverse rendering, re-rendering, and optimization uh, throughout this whole process um, for the three car shapes. And now the cool thing about that is that now you can basically, this de-rendering of the scene is actually labels you can use for um, like downstream training of 3D detection networks. And what we found is that these labels are almost just as good as manual labels you would get from uh, LiDAR. Uh, we did the follow-up work at ECCV. So that previous work is called SDF Label, was not all at CPR. And we did follow-up work uh, at ECCV uh, where we didn't use any LiDAR. We really just did it this time from, from images. So to conclude, um, I've talked about self-supervised 3D vision and our research in that area. I've explained why we are doing it. It's to get robust 3D perception from uh, vision. How do we do it? We use geometry for scalable 3D self-supervision. I talked about super depth, which was in the stereo case, PacNet, which was in the monocular structure for motion case. Uh, I showed that it works for one camera, multiple cameras, like the full surround mono depth, for even weird cameras, like the neural ray, uh, where for which you need to use the neural ray surfaces. In the second part, I talked about beyond self supervised learning using semi supervision from maybe partial point clouds, but you can also use them not just at training, but also at inference time. Semantic guidance, where you can use pre trained networks for semantic segmentation but also you can use simulation. And this is the good work that we talked about. And finally, I very briefly brushed on how we use monocular def, uh, mainly for 3D detection, but also for uh, auto-labeling uh, thanks to differentiable rendering. That's a lot of work. Um, these are basically uh, uh, like, a, this is the bibliography. Uh, I'll share the slides uh, so people can have all the references. Um, and just as a reminder, code is available, data sets are available, 
we're organizing this workshop and competition at CEPR, which I encourage you to participate um, in. Um, you can find more information on TRI Global website or on my website. Obviously, uh, that's a lot of work. It takes a village to do that. So thanks to my uh, many collaborators. And um, thank you for your attention. And, um, and uh, yeah, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Cool, fantastic. Thanks a lot, Adrian. That was really interesting. I actually do have a couple of questions, but maybe let me ask first if somebody else wants to go. Can I uh, ask if, uh, of course, in this very beautiful sketch you've given here of the uh, depth assessment, does it make sense to use 3D information? So as opposed to working from an image, could you gain a lot of extra learning capability from saying this is a moving scene with other objects that are maybe stationary or have some limited speed. Uh, is there, are there opportunities in that direction? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's a great question. So it, it's a fairly deep question. So we, we're doing some of that, but not enough of that. So in the sense of like the semi-supervised learning, when you have like this multi-sensor uh, setup, we are reasoning in 3D, but we're just for optimization purposes, reprojecting it into the 2D image plane. Um, so for the neural ray surface also, we also reason in 3D. Um, but um, the, I think the case where we used 3D information the most and this kind of like 3D composition of the scene is really this auto-labeling work. Uh, because in the auto-labeling work, uh, the scene parameters are 3D scene parameters, right? It's, it's the mm -hmm. full 3D scene that we're trying to reconstruct. Um, so here we're focusing in this work, we're focusing just on objects, but one interesting research direction that we're actively working on is reconstructing everything in the scene in 3D um, and to be able to do the reasoning uh, exactly in the way you described, Peter. Thanks. Yeah, maybe to continue along that direction. I mean, in, in principle, if I understand this correctly, using this differentiable renderer, you can you can you turn this essentially into a totally generic unfolding problem, right? It doesn't need to be. You can replace the renderer, which of course does some ray tracing through you know the, the atmosphere and stuff, with something that hasn't even have optics, right? In principle, you can have some arbitrary unfolding of some arbitrary physical system as long as you know somehow how to go from the scene parameters yep. to then to the output which you have accessible, right? With your sensor. Exactly, exactly. And this is actually what we've done because uh, if you look at this optimization, so the second work that I mentioned is using only images. Um, uh, so for self-supervised uh, differentiable rendering, but here we're using LiDAR point cloud. So going back to Peter's question also, here we're reasoning in 3D because we have a 2D loss, but we also have a 3D loss, which you see is being optimized at the bottom uh, of the animation. And, and so we actually made a differentiable renderer, which is a 3D differentiable renderer of sine distance field of SDFs. Uh, and so here we, we, we leverage the properties of that uh, SDF space uh, to basically optimize uh, the uh, auto labels and the shapes. So it's not a renderer, it's not a renderer per like in a game engine sense. It's actually a renderer of uh, the output we're trying to optimize over. Yeah, I see, I see, nice. And maybe look, you hinted a bit at that at the generalization but i also i think correct me if, I, if i'm wrong but i think you know with, with autonomous driving what you really need to get correct is somehow the generalization to the very extreme tales of the events that can occur on, on a road right I mean, that yes. are usually accidents happen because of a reason right it's just a long chain of <laughs> unfortunate you know coincidences or whatever yes how how stable is all of this or you know s s some of these techniques to these very in a strange, unexpected situation or unexpected inputs? Yes, so that's, that's a very good question. And that's like what animates us. Uh, um, and, and that's why when we're looking at examples, like uh, the one I had shown uh, before, we're looking at very little details to see if it works, right? Um, yes. So, um, so yes, so how does it generalize to the long tail? Um, so for us, in terms of computer vision first, like the long tail can be like very fine grained details. So uh, if we look at, um, things like this, for instance, right? Like uh, construction cones, right? You don't see them very often. You don't see a lot of them, right? Um, or uh, things like thin structures. Like here, you don't care too much about that. That's, that's okay. Um, but um, there's uh, other instances like a child, like a child, you know, like it has a weird size distribution compared to most of your pedestrians. So I think that um, the challenge is that machine learning is pattern recognition. And, uh, and the long tail 
means you might not sample, uh, sample have enough samples to generalize to that um, to those rare events, and uh, there's really no way around that besides two things. One is well, you need to replace the lack of evidence, right, of experience for that long tail by prior knowledge, right. Mm -hmm. You, you need enough information to be able to make predictions. So if you don't observe it, then you need to inject it, right? right. Uh, and, so, and so using stronger priors, using more structure, et cetera. The issue with that is that you need to be right as a human when you decide to implement those priors, because if those priors turn out to be wrong or biased, uh, as we know in machine learning, you know, this is why there were like racist computer vision algorithms, right? Not because people were necessarily racist, but because people didn't think about over like like darker skin colors, for instance, right? Uh, because they were themselves white, mm. and so and so that's very dangerous to not be careful when you design these priors. Um, and the other solution being, for instance, data. Uh, so okay, I have the long tail. I have these rare events. I have only ten examples of that. I need hundred more, right? So you need to go and find those examples. And there's ways to do that. Uh, but it has the same issues as what I mentioned before about the human bias, which is you need to be aware of what long tail right. events you want to boost in your signal. And so that's also why I like self-supervised learning because self-supervised learning is taking kind of an extreme stance on this, which is, you know, like uh, if you know the Hard Rock Cafe uh, motto, love all, serve all, you know, well, this is what self-supervised learning does. It tries to learn from all the data. And hopefully you have enough of everything uh, if you collected enough data. Uh, and because you can train from all the data, maybe that's gonna work. Now, the problem is that's not also like a perfect picture because all the biases in your data, like the dominant modes, for instance, will be dominating your learning process too. Hmm. So you have to also account for that, but it's complex. It's, it's got more complex in self-supervised learning because self-supervised means less human oversight. So, so, so this is really hard. I mean, I'm listing problems. I don't have a solution, right? This is why it's a research challenge. Uh, so the long tail is like, as you said yourself, it's, it's a long tail problem in itself because if mm. you start to kind of unroll mm. the issues, it's like, it's never mm. ending. Um, yeah. So I think we need some fundamental yeah. pro scientific progress to tackle that issue. It's not easy. Yeah, yeah that, that's a very nice answer. <laughs> Thanks a lot. It's, uh, okay. it's, a, it's a long answer because it's a very, it's a core <laughs> problem for us. It, it's a very, yeah, right. As you say, right, exactly. Yeah. And also one that affects many other people, I suppose. It's, I mean, this is not specific to that specific problem, right? I mean, any machine learning driving, problem. The... Yeah, right, right. And when the stakes are high, of course, that, you know, becomes important to get right or to try to, you know. Yep, to, to absolutely, it. absolutely. Uh, here's a, a, one more question, which I apologize because it's very vague. Having thought a lot about this, you know, with your colleagues and so on for, you know, for uh, a long time, is there anything to be said about why evolution didn't come up with this? So why do we have two eyes? Why do, you know, most species on this planet have two eyes instead of a single one? I mean, we have two eyes, but actually there is, we have very strong monocular depth cues. Right. I think I was rereading recently, the Wikipedia article on, 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 on depth perception is really good. Uh, and, and it covers a lot of, about this, including the monocular depth cues. And it's quite fun article to read because you can like close one eye and do these experiments and check for yourself, like experiment on yourself, you know, uh, which every scientist should do, uh, you know, uh, responsibly. Uh, but like here it's easy, you know, you don't have to poke your eye out, just hide your eye and just try a couple of different things. And, and you'll see that we, even though stereo and, and parallax and all these kind of things are what like binocular vision is what enables precise depth perception, you can do pretty good depth perception with just one eye. Right, so after evolution did came up to do so, right? Yeah, I mean, and, uh, we... without training, evolution did come up with it. So you could, you could try, yeah, you know, I can, grab, I can grab my glass and I can drink, you know, I can touch my ah. nose. Uh, but and, isn't and, that just because your visual cortex already has learned how to deal with the information from two eyes and then you triple it back if one of them goes missing? Like if, if the only thing you ever had from your birth was just a single eye, yeah, you know, actually, that principally could go through the same steps. I think I think that would uh, I don't know if there was ever an experiment or someone uh, that mm -hmm. actually was in this situation, so I don't know. Uh, but from first principles, it would seem like it would still be the, uh, okay because you again have motion. Right. Exactly. So you can That's get exactly parallax motion, etc. Right. Et right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. Nice. Uh, thanks so much, Peter. Do you have anything else? Because you're unmuted. I think we're good. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs>
thank you very much. Yeah, this Thanks was a wonderful you. talk. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.